So in this second part, take a moment to write this down. But better yet, have that formula sheet in front of you. I mean, I wrote it here just to, for myself to comment on some of the stuff I wrote here. But you really must uh, get used to um, refer back and forth to to that summary on vessel functions that I uh, provided on Blackboard. So if you didn't print that yet, just make sure you print it out as soon as possible. So. <clears throat> um, on the top of the page, I wrote again the recurrence formula. So there is a recurrence formula for this integral when you integrate um, s to the n times the vessel function of order zero. It's called the recurrence formula because you can apply this repeatedly, right? I mean, if you start with s to the n, you end up with the same type of integral s to the n minus two. So you can repeat this formula until you can no longer um, compute this. So you end up either with the integral of j naught, which you cannot compute explicitly, so you leave it in that integral form, or you may end up with SJ naught, which can be computed as you could see in the previous example. So part A, I mean, I just uh, used A and C because there is another boundary condition in the formula sheet labeled by B. I will talk about that in a different lecture, but part A um, is the type of Fourier Bessel series which we discussed so far, right? That comes from Dirichlet type of conditions. So when you have let's say, a uh, prescribed temperature on the boundary equal to zero, you normally end up with um, eigenvalues coming from this equation, from setting J naught equal to zero. So the fourier bessel series then has this formula for the coefficients, uh, again, when alpha Js come from this equation. Never forget that's always, uh, in some cases, something that is a miss. Uh, in the process, people keep on forgetting where, they, where these alpha j's come from. Never forget where they come from, depending on the situation. Because see, where they come from may change depending on the problem. So in this part, a j naught of alpha j c is equal to zero, because that's where alpha j's come from, from solving this equation for alpha. Well, remember, we have other type of boundary conditions. So let's say the condition was insulation on the boundary. That means there is no heat flow on the boundary. That means typically that's, as you will see later in other examples, that means a space derivative is equal to zero at the boundary point. That typically leads to a Sturm-Levin problem in which the conditions appear in the form of a derivative equal to zero. Now, remember that J naught prime is related to J1. So, um, we mentioned before in the in the previous um, in some of the previous examples uh, to never forget those little computation rules, namely that j naught prime of x is equal to minus j one of x. So to say that j naught prime is equal to zero, j naught prime of alpha c is equal to zero. This is equivalent to j one of alpha c equal to zero. Make sure you remember that because this is not obvious from the problem. So the problem will not usually tell you this fact. But it's very important in the computation and in the solving of the Sturm-Levin problem to keep this in mind. So <clears throat> any Bessel equation, remember any Bessel function will have infinitely many roots. So now when you set this condition equal to zero, again, you're going to have infinitely many roots. Alpha 1, alpha 2 alpha j and so on, uh, which are the solutions or the roots of the equation j naught prime of alpha c equals zero, which is the same as j one of alpha c equal to zero. Same because again, j naught prime is minus j one. And it's very important at this point to really understand that the alpha j's in this part in the formula c are not the same as the alpha j's in part a. So alpha j's in A, not the same as alpha j's in part C, or in any other formula for that matter, for different boundary conditions. So there's no overlap. <clears throat> um, so when you have this type of boundary conditions, again, you can also have a Fourier representation in terms of these Bessel functions. Notice, though, that in this case, the formula for the first coefficient, just like in the cosine series, 
is not going to be the same as the other one. So you have two different formulas. The first guy is given by this, and then the rest of them, I should mention here j from 2, 3, and so on, right? Because the count for j starts from 1, right? So the rest of the formula is given by this for the coefficients. So in when you have Newman conditions, you will have to um, compute these separately, these integrals. So in my next, uh, so make sure you write this down. Okay, I'll pause for a moment. Make sure you write this down or have these in front of you because on my next page, I'm going to go over um, writing down a Fourier representation for x squared. Okay, so I'm, so I'm slightly more complicated than just a constant using these two different types of conditions just to see how the Fourier uh, Bessel series looks like in each case. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let's start with um, the Newman type of conditions, right? So we want, as an example, we want to write x squared in, form, in the form of a Fourier Bessel series um, in which alpha j come from, so alpha j are the roots of j naught prime of alpha c equals zero, uh, which again, remember, is the same as j one of alpha c equals zero. So now let's get straight to the um, computing the coefficient using those formulas. So a1, um, according to the formula, is equal to 2 over c squared, the integral from 0 to c, x times x squared. Remember, in the formula, there is that extra x, because these are orthogonal with weight function x. So nothing fancy here. There's um, just a basic power rule. x fourth over four between zero and c, two c fourth over uh, four c squared. This cancels to, or simplifies to c squared over two. So that is the first coefficient. <clears throat> and now comes the fun part. So aj, let's look carefully at the formula and really look, right? Don't just trust my word for it. I mean, just pause for a moment and maybe even set up yourself um, the integral. So 2 over c squared j naught of alpha j c squared the integral from 0 to c x times x squared j naught of alpha j x dx. In actual boundary value problems, remember this typically um, is um, in terms of rho. So 2 over c squared uh, j naught alpha j c squared, the integral from 0 to c, x to the power 3 j naught of alpha j x dx. So remember what I told you in the previous part, to make it easy on applying that recurrence formula when you deal with this integral, always, always make a substitution to change alpha j x into a new variable. Even better, since that recurrence formula was in terms of s, like the integral of you know s to the n, uh, why don't you just call that new variable s? So just replace alpha j x with a new variable s, which means ds is alpha j dx. And let's continue. So we have 2 over c squared j naught of alpha j c squared. Don't forget to change the bounds. Uh, now the new bounds are 0 c alpha j. x becomes s over alpha j. So here we have s over alpha j to the power 3. j naught of s dx is 1 over alpha j ds. 
All right, so to make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to pull the alpha j out, right? So notice I have alpha j to the power 3, alpha j by itself. When I take it out, that's going to be alpha j to the power 4. And now you're left to an integral for which you can apply the recurrence formula. Pause for a moment and please compare this with the recurrence formula so that you can um, do this correctly. Um, so in the recurrence formula, let me write it, you know, remind you here, right? So we have this integral from zero to C alpha J S third J naught of S. So you're going to have N equals three. And instead of X, the upper bound, you will put C alpha J. So just use the formula in the form, in the way it is, in the way it looks like, and just replace X with C alpha J and N with three. So have that in front of you while I go over these steps. So this is equal to this constant, two over C squared alpha J four, J naught of alpha J C to the power two. And now comes the recurrence formula. So the recurrence formula states that this is C alpha J to the power three J one of C alpha J plus N minus one, which will be two in my case, C alpha J squared. That's just X to the power uh, N minus one, basically, in my case, J naught of C alpha J. And then minus uh, three minus one squared, that's just two squared, which is four, the integral from zero to C alpha J. Then you subtract two from the power here, S, J naught of S. So because N was odd, you end up with S J naught, which can be integrated. So you can go further and actually solve this. So before we do that, though, remember, always remember where these guys come from. So wh what did we say beforehand? That the alpha J's are the roots of J naught prime equals zero. But J naught prime is nothing but J one of alpha C. So J one of, al you know, alpha J C or C alpha J is the same thing. J one of these guys is zero. So this guy is gonna be zero, this, this part of the parenthesis. And remember the antiderivative of SJ naught is SJ one. All right, so we could solve that integral on the next step. Let's do carry over again the first part. This guy is zero to C alpha J squared J naught of C alpha J. And the antiderivative is SJ one. So that's gonna be minus four S J one of S between zero and C zero and C alpha J. So this is actually quite neat, as neat as it gets basically to these type of problems. Once again, when I plug in C alpha J, I still I have J1 at C alpha J. In my case, that's going to be zero. When I plug in zero for S, that's going to be zero again. So this is nothing but zero minus zero. So when everything is said and done, I'm going to have two over this times this. I can cancel a J naught of C alpha J. Um, let's see. Uh, what do I have here? C squared goes away. Alpha J squared goes with alpha J to the power of four. So when I simplify everything, this ends up being four over alpha J squared J naught of C alpha J. Right? Because one copy of J naught cancels. C squared disappears. Alpha J squared with alpha J fourth leaves alpha J squared on the bottom. So the Fourier representation for x squared using these boundary conditions is equal to 
a1, remember that was c squared over 2, plus summation from 2 to infinity aj, which we just computed, alpha j squared j naught of c alpha j. That, those are the coefficients. This is just aj multiplied by the Bessel function, which is j naught of alpha j x. So in the, in the context of a boundary value problem, when, let's say, the initial condition is rho squared, you will probably have to write down a series in this format just to match the coefficients, to find the coefficients um, that appear in that boundary value problem. These will be your eigenfunctions. This will be the Fourier-Bessel coefficients. Um, so let's see how a, the same function x squared looks like if I do, if I use the um, the other type of conditions, the uh, Dirichlet conditions that we used beforehand. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the same part just to maintain some um, continuity here. So. Let's say I want the same function, x squared, to be written in terms of um, summation from 1 to infinity, aj, um, j naught of alpha j x, but this time the alpha j's are different. This time alpha j are the roots of j naught of alpha j, excuse me, j naught of alpha c equals 0. So the roots of j naught of alpha c equals 0, which means, of course, from this point on, you should assume that uh, when you plug in alpha j for alpha, you get 0 into the Bessel function. All right, so what is the formula? If you look at part A, the formula for this uh, type of representation, well, the formula states that aj should be 2 over c squared j1 this time, notice, not, not j0, not, j1, c alpha j to the power of 2, the integral from 0 to c, um, x times x squared, which makes it um, x to the power of 3. <clears throat> um, yeah, j0 of... Um, alpha jx dx <clears throat> want to check something first okay good <clears throat> all right so like i said before the first step because to make it easy to use this recurrence formula the first step make that substitution make s to be whatever is easy inside the Bessel function. So make the substitution s equal alpha jx. Um, and so this step is kind of similar to the one before, right? So ds means is alpha j dx. And now the integral is from 0 to c alpha j, right? Or the new bounds. Uh, let's see, c times alpha j. Um, x to the power 3 again becomes s over alpha j to the power 3 j naught of s and ds becomes um, excuse me dx becomes ds over alpha j alright so this, this step is similar to the one beforehand just like the step beforehand, let's pull the alpha j on the outside. So you have 2 uh, over c squared um, j1 squared uh, c alpha j and then alpha j to the power 4, right? So you pull out alpha j third, alpha j on the bottom. That's alpha j to the power 4. Okay, and then the integral that is left, just like before, is going to be from 0 to C alpha J of S third J naught of S dS. So it's the same recursion, by the way, because it's the same function. The only thing to pay attention is 
when you get to solve it, remember now the roots come from different place. Previously, remember J1 of C alpha J was zero. Now J naught of C alpha J is zero. Otherwise, the recurrence formula is the same, right? So um, let's apply it right now. So we're gonna, we're gonna have two over C squared J1 squared C alpha J, alpha J to the power four. And other recurrence formula. So C alpha J to the power three, <clears throat> J1 of C alpha J. The middle term now is two C alpha J to the power two J naught of C alpha J. And then minus four, the integral from zero to C alpha J S J naught of S DS. So pause for a moment and please look at the example beforehand, right? The, the previous example on the previous page. The recurrence formula was the same, but the alpha j's come from different place. Now it's no longer true that j1 is zero. However, j naught is zero, right? So I mean j naught of alpha j c is zero. So at this point, you can replace this middle guy with zero. And so notice that in the end, your answer will be in terms of J1. Uh, just like before, this can be integrated, except it's not zero like before, right? So let's, let's do one more step. Copy this first part. Remember SJ naught is the derivative of SJ1. So the antiderivative is S J1 of S between zero and C alpha J. One more, uh, a little bit more uh, mopping out here. C alpha J to the power three, J1 of C alpha J and I'll plug in C alpha J for S. And we plug in zero for S, that's just zero. This is the final answer. We can make, make it a little bit better. Uh, we can um, pull out some common factors to simplify. So in particular, let's see, we can pull out um, C alpha J and J1. Right, so two uh, C alpha J, J1, C alpha J, and you're left in the parentheses with C alpha J to the power two, um, minus four. And on the bottom we have C alpha J to the power four, J1 squared of C alpha J. Let's see, we can cancel the C, one copy of alpha J, and you're left with three over here. J1 with one copy of it on the bottom. <clears throat> and then the final coefficient here in a more compact form is going to be two C alpha J squared minus four over C alpha J third, J1 of C alpha J. <clears throat> All right, um, so let me take maybe one more minute and put together our results from um, uh, top to finish, basically. So if alpha j are the roots of j naught prime of alpha c equals zero, we had a representation for x squared. Um, given by c squared over two plus the summation of this guy. And remember in this case, this is the same as j one of alpha c equals zero. These two are equal. I mean, they're not equal uh, in general. j naught prime is minus j one, but if this is zero, this is zero as well. In the second part of our discussion, we show that 
uh, if alpha j are the roots of j not of alpha c equals zero, precisely the same function can be written as summation from one to infinity of the coefficient in that case was two c alpha j square minus four c alpha j third j one of c alpha j and then the Bessel function j naught of um, alpha j x. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the last thing I want to mention today <clears throat> is again to point out I know I mentioned this several times already but it's it's worth repeating it when you deal with this for the first time these are really different series these are like having the sine series and cosine series for the same function right which uh, remember they're different um, if you remember the first part of the class um, what you see here and here, these are different functions. I know that the notation is the same, but again, never forget the context. The alpha j's here come from here. The alpha j's in the second part come from a different equation. So again, alpha j's are not the same uh, between these two representations. So I think that's enough for today. This will be a this was a more condensed lecture, but uh, it's important uh, to take your time and go through the steps because you will be expected to solve a typical problem like this, uh, basically in the homework or exam. So you need to make sure you uh, get used to the mechanics of um, problems like this. So that's it for today.